organisms on the planet are parasites on plants because plants are the only thing that make their own food and they make their food out of sunlight, water and carbon dioxide. And because of that, they are running the show. A plant teacher is, I mean, the best way to look at it is you look at a plant as a being, as you would a, as a friend. Each plant has a personality, as each human does. You take on the traits of a plant, you know, and plants are very sensitive and very intuitive. And, you know, in healing, you need to be very sensitive and very intuitive. When you're working with the systems of natural healing, it's really fascinating because you come to realize that plants, you know, if it wasn't for plants, we just simply wouldn't be here. They give us air, they give us food, through capturing the light of the sun and gathering the nutrients of the earth. And they also have special qualities that affect different areas of our body differently. Cannabis, aka marijuana, hemp, weed, tea, pot, etc., was once a commonly used American medicine which somehow turned into a dangerous, illegal drug. 19 states and the District of Columbia allow marijuana for medical use, but federal law still prohibits it. The plant contains another interesting substance, cannabidiol, also known as CBD. CBD does not produce um, a THC-like high in animals or humans. It can have um, anti-seizure effects. It's long been known to have anti-inflammatory effects. Already in 1975, VCU pharmacologists published a paper on the startling discovery that THC shrinks certain lung cancer tumors. But the experiment ended right there when the government cut the funding. There was a war on drugs, and um, they had no idea really how it worked. When I got into this field in 1989, they hadn't discovered the cannabinoid receptor yet. Oxycodones. I got 150. They can lead to stomach problems, to liver damage, and even to death. Much more dangerous than cannabis, which is not being used, is not being developed. I'm risking jail in order to save my life. It's a pretty weird situation in which one has the sense that it's the government that's trying to kill me. It's very hard to make the same size tablet. If, if, you know, if this were properly done by medical companies, it would be a lot better. I completed 14 days of whole brain radiation, and the effects are terrible. I've lost my balance. I'm confused. My tongue is burning, and I've lost most of my hair. But the worst of it is that the radiation had only a small effect on my tumors. So, I'll continue to take cannabis because it's amazing what cannabinoids can do. They affect just about every disease in the body. That has to reflect the underlying endocannabinoid system. So maybe the endocannabinoid system should be studied and unraveled, much in the same way as the genetic code has been done. It's a really exciting prospect. It's too late for me, but I am still thrilled by the idea of what they might come up with. When we use a plant to heal, let's say we use a plant, a bitter plant, like yarrow, this bitter flavor goes in and this medicine will start to cleanse out the liver. And one of the things that happens when you cleanse the liver is you actually start to move stored emotion. And so part of the healing process is to actually move and keep flow happening in the body where there might otherwise be stuck, either stuck emotional issues, grief, resentment, um, fear. These are all stored in different areas of the body. And this is a traditional understanding around the world. You can't separate the health of the body from the health of the mind. We live in a culture that's spiritually very deprived, very empty. We live in a culture that's very material-based. In other words, we live in a culture that does not give human beings what they really need. That leaves a huge hole in people. 
Most people in North America and the Western world are not as connected as people who live in the jungle and live in nature, you know, every day, 365 days a year. Shaman Guillermo Arevalo believes everyone can reclaim this connection through ayahuasca, which he calls a plant teacher. He says the vine of the soul actually teaches you what you need to know. It's a tea, or, or what herbalists would call a decoction, meaning a strong tea. It's always made from two plants, one of which contains the hallucinogen, dimethyltryptamine, or DMT. DMT is what I call a true psychedelic. It's one of the class that includes LSD, psilocybin, mescaline. La ayahuasca te conoce, te hace conocer. Ayahuasca es un medio para que al hombre le pueda hacer conocer los diferentes niveles del universo. La fuente de creación nos hace ver de dónde viene el hombre, ¿no? que procede del espacio. De dónde viene eh, la energía, que es de la luz. En de dónde nosotros estamos formados. Entonces, hay esa re relación de la naturaleza, energía y de luz. These psychedelics are medicines of the spirit in a certain way. They treat spiritual dysfunctions. These psychedelics, under the right circumstances, can be used to treat and actually resolve, cure, if you want to use that term, a number of things, ranging from intractable depression to addictions to uh, post-traumatic stress and even other things that you might not expect, like cluster headaches. These things can open up the mind and the heart and allow for insights and real therapeutic changes that talk therapy takes a much longer to get there and, and pharmacotherapy as it's practiced by conventional psychiatry doesn't really address at all. The, you know, most of the panoply of psychopharmaceuticals are either ineffective or barely effective or effective in a much smaller group of people than they're prescribed to. And I think psychiatry you know, relies far too much on those things, and we need to find some way to reintegrate psychedelics into psychiatry. I think ayahuasca has two functions. One is self-discovery, and trying to understand better who you are, and also it helps you to connect with the invisible world, with the spirit world. It could be related to nature, you know, the meaning of God, having a clearer sense of what it means for you in your life. So it helps you to redefine yourself in relationship to that. Guillermo has been a shaman to the Shipibo people most of his life, but only recently opened a retreat for Westerners. Creo que es importante hacerlo porque los occidentales han perdido su raíz cultural, han perdido el conocimiento de, del uso de la medicina natural o tradicional. As we get closer to our natural mind, there's another level of intelligence that comes out of us, and plants are always sort of uh, ushering us in that direction. They're always teaching us how to be grounded, how to open, how to share and work together, and how to bloom. And that's really the essence of natural healing. So the first thing that we have to do when we come to these plants is acknowledge them as living beings, not just as something we're coming to snip up. And s traditionally, uh, there was always some, some way of communicating to the plants when you're harvesting, saying thank you in some way. That doesn't mean you have to offer tobacco necessarily, though if that's your tradition, that's great. But what it means is that there's some acknowledgement between the human being and the plant. And so when we start to pick medicine, the power of the medicine isn't just in the chemicals, it's in the relationship. An awful lot of people have literally shut down the fourth of the heart chakra because they've been wounded. It could be jilted at a dance all the way to an ugly divorce. And that's where the problem is. In the flower essences, you can be able to open the heart but have it protected. Most people are scared to open up the fourth chakra because they've been wounded. The 
Flower essence is the energizer. Because if I have a person comes in has had a heart attack, I can be throwing hawthorn at them and reishi and coenzyme Q10 and all those herbs, but they won't stick. If the chakras close down, there's not enough magnetic energy to do that. So I have to open that up. So I need the flower essence to open that level up so they can have a magnetic thing to be able to attract the herbs too. We can also, let's say, imagine being with a burdock, which is a very mighty and strong, almost intimidatingly sized plant. We know now that burdock is incredibly nutritious and it's a desmutagen, which helps remove toxins from the body. But in days gone past, we would just spend time with that plant and we would recognize that it is incredibly strong, it's very good at multiplying, and it's very big. And so if you see a person that's depleted, you would use a plant that's kind of the balance of that. You would use a plant that brings that energy. When we look at the plants in this way, what we're, what we're doing is we're thinking more intuitively and more meditatively. And when we combine that with our laboratory information and our textbooks, it's incredibly powerful. And we have to remember there's still things yet to learn that we may not already know and that haven't been discovered in laboratory yet. The rishis of ancient India, the wise people of Europe, those are the, one, the ways that they used to learn about nature and learn about plants is they would spend time in nature, which no matter what is good for us and try to intuit and try to learn about the plants. If we really want to be fully empowered, we need to recognize that our body and these plants have been living together for hundreds and thousands of years, and we have a relationship already that we really just need to remember.